how did you end up choosing UCLA for college? Well, I guess the main reason I chose UCLA was uh, the fact that my brother Rafer uh, had a, had chosen UCLA out of Kingsburg High uh, for his college sports career, and he's uh, Ray was a senior in high school when I was a freshman. And so I got to watch his career as it progressed and uh, got very excited about the fact that I had an opportunity to go to UCLA. Was there um, any reason to go right to UCLA after high school while you went to Santa Monica City School? Well, uh, I, I guess it all boiled down to, from my point of view, as uh, an athlete, it gave me an opportunity uh, that was a metropolitan conference that Santa Monica City College was was a part of, and uh, it gave me a chance to work against a higher level of uh, football player for my freshman season because UCLA's freshman season only – uh, had five games. The freshman at UCLA played five games. And so it gave me a chance to, to work against a tougher level and a brand of a uh, football player in preparation that freshman year at Santa Monica. And it also gave me an opportunity to uh, up my game in a couple of uh, academia classes. Because freshmen at that time couldn't play – varsity sports, is that correct? Pardon me, say again? At that time, freshmen could not play varsity sports. They had to sit out their freshman year. Or was that just the basketball? Yeah. Freshmen participated against freshmen. And they only had five games. So your brother was already... So your brother was so your brother was at UCLA running track. There was another famous uh, person who played track, football, baseball. At UCLA, Jackie Robinson. Did you ever get a chance to meet him when you were at UCLA? Uh, no, I never got a chance to meet uh, Jackie. I came down to uh, participate in a while I was still in high school. Uh, attended uh, a couple of the UCLA games. Uh, during the season prior to me getting to UCLA. But I never had a chance to uh, meet or get to know uh, Jackie. So when you played at UCLA, you didn't just play defensive corner. You played on offense, too. Is that correct? Yes. I was uh, I was in the single wing formation, which uh, – which Coach Barnes uh, had in this program. And let me say that Red Sanders was at UCLA, and I was expecting to play under his tutelage. And he unfortunately passed away. But uh, what was it like having a new coach there? Well, it worked out really nice uh, in reference to a, a transitional movement between one one varsity coach to the other. Uh, coach Billy Barnes uh, took over uh, when Mr. Sanders passed away. Uh, no, I take that back. It was uh, Craig Dickerson took okay. over uh, when Coach Barnes passed away. And Coach Dickerson, it, it created a, a monumental pressure recruiting and whatnot. But it, Coach, Coach Dickerson had a nervous breakdown. And, and when, he did, when he had that in the whole recruiting wars and running up to Cal to 
try to talk a, a, a high school player back into the mind to come to UCLA. Coach Tipperson passed away. Coach Billy Barnes took over and was, was at UCLA for my last three years of college career. Did you prefer playing offense or defense, or you didn't care? I actually preferred to play offense. I, in the single wing formation that we used at UCLA, I was in a wing back slot, and the wing back slot uh, didn't really get to carry the ball that much. So from that position, I would be flanked out and become a part of the passing game, and and would run that reverse a couple of times a game, but really didn't carry the ball that much. I was in the wing back position on any given play. I was usually scraping along the line and blindsiding uh, uh, offensive linemen. Was USC your biggest rival back then, or was it Washington or Stanford? It was. It was definitely USC. Definitely USC. What were those games like playing them at the uh, Coliseum? It it was a, a monumental situation for someone like myself uh, coming to UCLA via Kingsburg High School in the San Joaquin Valley, a very small high school, and played to very small high school, <clears throat> high school crowds. So it was, it was, to say the least, it was, it was a very overpowering experience. But what I think worked in my behalf was the fact, the fact that I went to Santa Monica City College for my freshman year, had a very nice uh, season there, both academia and uh, also sports-wise. And it gave me a chance to play three sports for one more year. I played football, I played basketball, and I ran track and field for Santa Monica City College. So at uh, UCLA, you ran track, you played football. Did you play any basketball too there? Uh, no. <clears throat> I dropped out of – when I left junior college, I, I didn't play any more <clears throat> competitive uh, basketball. And I actually was not going to play uh, any. Let's see. I was actually just going to play once I got out of Santa Monica City College. I was just going to play football. And UCLA uh, had a very renowned coach by the name of Ducky Drake. And Ducky convinced me that if I stuck with track and field, I could be a world-class hurdler by the time I got out of UCLA. And I took him to his word and, and uh, participated uh, with the football department's good wishes uh, during spring training. I didn't have to attend spring, spring training. I ran track, and Ducky's words uh, rang to be true as I continued through my college career and had a pretty fantastic uh, track and field career. Was there a lot of pressure on you being Rafer's brother to run track? Did you ever think to yourself, you know what, I want to create my own name and I want to succeed in a different sport than my brother? Yes, there was a tremendous amount of pressure a tremendous amount of pressure, uh, not only for myself, but uh, a, a middle brother, Eddie Johnson, who was between age-wise with Ray and myself, uh, who was a great athlete, but was not able to overcome the pressures presented by an older brother who was a, a world-class athlete. And he didn't proceed as as far in in his sports career uh, as as he might if he hadn't had the pressures, and 
I watched him go through the pro- his problems, and it gave me a different insight on being a younger brother or a younger participant participant in the family. And I I handled it from a, a different angle, and uh, was able to work out a system to where I could be myself. You won the sixty. 60- 1960 uh, High Hurdle Championship at NC uh, in college, and you came in fourth in the trials in a photo finish. How hard was it not to be a part of that 60 Olympic team? That was absolutely devastating. That was probably the most devastating situation for me because I, I my brother was going to be there, and I had progressed in my last two track seasons to that world premier level and running good times uh, at UCLA, like I said, under the tutelage of uh, Ducky Drake. And so I was really primed to, to making that Olympic team. And after the NC2A finals, which were held at UC Berkeley, I ran in some AAU meets and ran some 13, 9, 14 flat, 13, I think about 13, 7. I ran some really phenomenal times. And as the Olympic trials honed down to that last big meet, which was held at Stanford University, and In that situation, I, I, I won a couple of races, prelims, and then got to the finals uh, as, as as the number one seed in the finals. So I had a, a middle lane, I mean, right smack in the, in the, in the middle of the track. And... For seven hurdles, <clears throat> I, I led that race for seven hurdles. And at the seventh hurdle, I hit the seventh hurdle. And eighth, eighth hurdle, I, I neck, regained my balance, and, and as you said, got involved with the photo finish. And back in those days, it uh, not like today's situation where they, if you're in a photo finish, they know it right away. You know, they had to, to, to develop the film and make a decision. So it, it wasn't a real quick process. It was a lot of waiting around till they got the final results of that race. And uh, as you stated, uh, it was a photo finish. I think Hayes Jones, uh, myself, Jerry Tarr, who was a real strong hurdler from the University of Oregon, and Lee Calhoun, I believe it was, with the photo finish. And there went my uh, aspirations to become uh, an Olympian. But in my mind, I went back to what Ducky Drake had told me long ago when I was uh, a sophomore at UCLA, that if I worked at it, I could become a world-class hurdler. So I I was one, sh- one step short of making the 1960 Olympic Games. Did you ever race against Rafer? Never had a, a situation where I actually ran against Ray. Uh, no, no, I never had that opportunity. It probably was better off. <laughs> yeah, you know, Ray Ray was a, a, an excellent hurdler in his own right. He he won a state championship uh, and would have stuck with the hurdles uh, had not his high school coach uh, privyed him to information that. Uh, and, and his high school coach was Merle Dodson. 
and Merle told Ray that who was a hundred meter hundred yard dash guy because he had great speed that if he switched his event and removed himself from the uh, sprinter to become a hurdler, he also, you know, had world-class uh, prowess in reference to the hurdles. And Ray switched from the hurdles, uh, switched from the, being a dash man, 100, 220, to the hurdles where he completely dominated uh, the metro, the, the conference that we ran in from high school. He, he was a tremendous uh, 180 yard low hurdles and 120 yard highs. When did you find out you were going to get drafted? Well, to be very honest, I didn't think I was going to get drafted. Uh, Conversation was going around that I was uh, an individual that was going to be part of the draft, but I just kind of continued on with my college life at UCLA, and not really thinking <clears throat> in my fondest memories that that I would in fact be drafted. And then words kept getting around that the 49ers were interested. The Rams are interested. Uh, the uh, San Diego Chargers was interested, and a lot of things kind of happened for the dominoes to fall into place. Uh, one team was, and I guess in my situation, the Forty ers had kind of sent out feelers and and. Uh, To ask me, try to find out if I would be interested in playing with the 49ers. And then, of course, uh, that was a no-brainer. Of course, I would. And then I later found out that the 49ers was interested. Uh, the LA, the uh, LA Rams was interested, and the uh, San Diego Chargers were interested. Did you ever meet with Sid Gilman? With the Chargers, I I certainly I certainly did. Uh, Coach Coach Gilman was was a real uh, kind of a cheerleader guy in, in reference to my situation. So uh, I I met with uh, Coach Gilman and. Uh, I think Al, was Al Davis there then? Yes, I, I was just fishing for Al's name. I I had a meeting. I had several meetings with Al Davis and uh, Coach Gilman in L.A. And, and, and as the draft kind of went on uh, up in the Bay Area here. In, in, in fact, the, the morning of the draft, well, let me say, well, I'm kind of getting ahead. I'm answering questions you haven't even asked me yet. <laughs> but, 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 yes, the Chargers and, and the Rams and the 49ers were three teams that uh, came to the forefront that wanted me to be a part of their uh, – their draft program. So you were, I see that you were uh, preparing for the East-West Shrine game at Stanford, and then uh, was it a little bit throughout the Chargers to meet with uh, Gilman and Al Davis? Uh, yes, it was, like you say, we were on the Stanford campus uh, working out for the, as a team for the East-West Shrine game, and I had uh, a couple of lunch get-togethers with Al Davis and Sid, uh, and also, and they were supposed to draft me. They had said that they were going to draft me, and as, as you probably know, 
there if this guy is still available or if this guy is not available, we're going to draft you. So there were a lot of ifs and, and buts to decide what the Chargers uh, and the 49ers were going to do. And the morning of the draft, uh, I was with having breakfast with Sid Gilman and uh, Al Davis in their hotel suite uh, down near the Stanford campus. And like I said, it was all kind of lined up. If if such and such is still available, then this and this will happen and this will happen. But as it turned out, the 49ers had three first-round draft picks that year. Uh, VI, I think it was the Pittsburgh Steelers, they had their number one pick. And the St. Louis Cardinals, they had their number one pick. So they had three in the first round. And they ended up using their own number one pick, first round pick. They chose me as their pick. And with the other two, Pittsburgh and the St. Louis picks, they they got uh, Bill Kilmer and Bernie Casey uh, made up the, the three draft choices that they, they, they had. So you were in the Chargers suite, and you got drafted by the 49ers. Yes, I'm uh, on on the – in Palo Alto, the morning, they had come by and picked me up and took me to their suite. Uh, and like I said, I was having uh, a little breakfast as because they were going to draft me number one, I believe. What did they say when they found out the 49ers beat them to the punch? Well... <laughs> I don't really recall, but it was all a very uh, admirable gathering, you know. They were, they, they were very excited about, I think, the possibilities of me playing for them, and I was equally excited. So there was a little overlay of all shucks, you know, and... I went. I finished my breakfast and, and, and went back over to the campus dorms to continue my preparation for the East-West game. But it was, and to add an addendum, addendum to that, a couple of weeks prior to that, or a week prior to that, I had had dinner in Los Angeles with uh, Coach Gilman and Al Davis again, working on where I was going to be drafted and how how they could get me in the draft. And like we said, the 49ers jump-started and took me quicker. And so I wasn't available. Were the Chargers going to use you on offense or defense? Well, you know, they were probably going to use me on offense and it, 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 exactly the same mindset as the 49ers had. Uh, I was a pretty good wide receiver. I had good hands. Uh, I had really excellent speed, and I ran good patterns and so the Chargers were going to use me on offense, and and the 49ers had definitely stated that uh, they'd use me on offense, knowing full well that I had uh, abilities as a defensive back. You had to be happy, though. You were going to be closer to home being in San Francisco. Yeah, that was one of the key, key uh, situations on my side. I was ex- 
extremely ecstatic with the possibilities of being in the Bay Area here, being in California, uh, playing the game here for either one of those teams. So, yeah, whether it would have been uh, the 49ers, uh, the Chargers, or, or the, the Oakland Raiders. So you joined the 49ers, whose coach was Red Hickey. What was Coach Hickey like? Coach Hickey was – it was hard to understand where he was coming from. He, I think with his military background – he treated uh, the team from top to bottom like we were recruits, like uh, in the Army. He, he had a very tough, tough approach and would let you know exactly how he felt. He didn't hold it. That was one good thing about him. If you were on his downside, he would let you know. And he would verbally let you know. In the middle of a practice, he'd stop the practice and he used all these red hot words, I guess you could say, <laughs> and as he corrected someone from making a mistake. And I mean, he'd stop a whole practice, a whole offensive practice, and and just jump all over the perpetrator on the team that had did you know that had really made a mistake or went went the wrong way or jumped in offside and he had a he would it was almost like he was <laughs> steaming you know like he was uh, so were you like playing off so were you playing offense and defense your first year with San Francisco? Well, my in my first year, I I, I had a couple of tragedies that happened to me. I I played in the East West Shrine game. I played uh, in the Coaches All American game in, in uh, Buffalo, New York, and then we went to Chicago to uh, start preparing for the college all-star game and Philadelphia was the previous season's uh, NFL champion. So that's who we were going to face off against. So I went into uh, Evanston, uh, Illinois, um, the Northwest, uh, Northwestern uh, college campus and went to work in preparing as one of the all-stars that was going to participate in the game against the Philadelphia Eagles. And in a practice session where uh, defense was not a part of my game plan or would be playing, I was a strictly an offensive end. And like I said, having real good speed and good hands, uh, I was beating a lot of guys out there on the one-on-one situation. And there was a defensive back by the name of Elbert Kimbrough. And I think Elbert went to uh, – had been drafted. No, Elbert had been drafted by the 49ers also. But in a – in a practice scrum, uh, passing drill, I was having a real super day, and Elbert from the, the strong safety position had to cover me on several occasions. And on this one occasion, I beat, uh, just totally blew by Elbert with uh, Billy Kilmer was the quarterback. And Bill let go on a post pattern to myself where I had beat Elbert really badly. And so I'm just waiting for the ball. And because of the floater, the ball was a floater. In my efforts to wait for them, Elbert made up the yardage that I had beat him. And 
really took me out with a tremendous tackle. And in that tackle, I, I dislocated my wrist my, and, and broke my arm. And so that was the, uh, that was the, once they put that in the cast, I was not able to be a uh, participant in the game. So when you're with the 49ers, one of the coaches with them was Jack Christensen, who was a great player with Detroit. Did Jack take you under his wing at all and teach you? Yes, he did. Uh, Jack worked tireless hours as a coach uh, in, in my behalf. But as as we said uh, a few moments ago, me coming to the 49er training camp with a, a busted, with a broken arm, uh, it was readily put on the board that I wasn't going to be with the offense my rookie year. And we had a doctor, our doctor, Dr. Milburn, uh, said to me that if, if I wanted to try to play my rookie year, that he would try to take my dislocated left wrist and and rework the bones just by pressure. And he he put me in the operating room on two different occasions, sedated me, and attempted to get those wrist bones back in position, a la a pool table. And I would be maybe able to play some ball my my rookie year, and he did that. But it was readily known I wouldn't play offense. But I did come back enough to, with proper protection on the on the uh, on the wrist, I was able to, to to play a lot of defenses back for them. You had a great rookie year, five interceptions. I mean, with a coming back from that broken wrist. I mean, did you surprise yourself how well you played your first year? Yes, I, I really did. I, I think I've surprised myself in, in, in reference to my abilities as a man-to-man -man coverage guy. I was put in a position a lot of times where I didn't – I had some inside help from the outside linebacker uh, and maybe some deep, deep help. Uh, from the free safety, uh, but for the most part, I was uh, I was on my own in reference to uh, figuring out this core of wide receivers uh, that were part of the NFL, and, and all of them great receivers in their own right. Uh, many times I was I was in a flanked out position with them. Uh, 20 yards from the line from the line of scrimmage and the def defensive uh, and offensive line with a very little help. And so uh, that rookie year, even with the broken arm, uh, I learned a lot about myself as a man-to-man uh, -man type guy. And, and I think over the years, those first few years where I was, in fact, uh, an excellent man-to-man -man guy that just worked in my behalf as my career got rolling along, you know, in my third or fourth or fifth year. I could, I could take a premier wide receiver like a Charlie Taylor from the Washington Redskins and, and hold my own knowing that I wasn't going to get a lot of help. 
And over the span of my career, it became known that teams would just not throw my way. They would, uh, on any given game plan, I may get uh, two balls, two balls thrown my way, and they'd work the other side. Was Charlie Taylor the toughest receiver you went up against? You know what, Charlie was was at the upper curve. He was amazing, but I I personally never categorized wide receivers as the best, or I could do this, or I could do that. I just knew from Sunday to Sunday I was going to have. Uh, my game plan was going to be full, just trying to take care of this wide receiver. And so there was a lot of wonderful. I, I think if if there was one guy that I kind of had an affinity to work against and be competitive, it was Tommy McDonald. And Tommy was with Phil the Philadelphia Eagles and later on in his career with uh, the L.A. Rams. But uh, a few comical things happened on the football field in a highly competitive football game that Tommy would do that uh, I couldn't figure out why he was doing it. So the main thing was just stay close to him. But he had great speed, little jackrabbit-like moves and patterns but he would be the one guy that uh, would be in that situation it, let me give you one little caveat as to how I got to that with Tommy we were playing uh, the Rams at, at uh, Kizar Stadium and Tommy ran a pattern on me, uh, and I blocked it. He ran another one, and I blocked it. But what he was doing when I would block a, that first pass pattern, you tend to kind of want to lounge a little bit, get up slow, and 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 feel good about the fact that you just knocked that ball down. Well, on that very first pass pattern to Tommy, I blocked it. And then the next thing I know, Tommy was jumped up and was running just as fast back to the huddle area as he was on the uh, the pass pattern that he had just run. And I, I, I thought he was trying to use a psych me out for some reason. So in order to be in position, I jumped up just as quick, and so it was like an offensive end and the defensive back going on a post pattern that took them 50 yards down the field. Now the two of them would jump up and run back up the field, back toward the line of scrimmage with the same kind of vigor and speed that they had run the pattern. And I later found out in that game, that that's just the way Tommy was. He was like a little jackrabbit. Amazing. Well, Jack Christensen, what was it like when he took over as head coach? Uh, Jack took over. I probably have around to sixty-three, up. I think. Yeah. Okay. Well, Jack and. Jack had been uh, the defensive backfield coach, so I was a little bit sad to lose him as an individual that was going to work very closely with me in reference to my abilities as a DB. And Hickey got fired. Jack took over, and... Coach Hickey was such a tyrant, and he had everybody walking on their heels. Uh, 
it was like it was like a a player would would be walking down the hallway in the dorm and would see Hickey way down the hallway. They would rather go out the door and and and, and actually go another way so they wouldn't have to run into Coach Hickey in the hallway. Because if you walked in, if you met him in the hallway, it it was a very high tension, stringent situation. So most everybody was trying to avoid eye to eye contact or verbalization contact with Coach Hickey as they moved in and out of the dorm. So he made it really difficult So the and and the players loved Coach Christensen. I mean, he was they loved him, and, and everybody wanted to win for 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 him. But I think we had been for so long under the iron fist of uh, Coach Hickey that I think most of the guys. Through a, throughout a period there, couldn't couldn't really participate because as much as they wanted to win for for the coach, they they, they just couldn't quite put their nose to the grindstone. So players started kind of doing silly things, not being on time, missing a meeting, not getting treatment, all the little bitty things a lot of the players started parlaying to and and we we just couldn't get a victory. We just it, it, the harder we tried, the less likely it would have been that we uh would get a victory. And, and, and again, I, I I think the reason for that was that it was just like it was like a bunch of guys getting out of jail or getting out of the army, you know, and all of a sudden being able to just kind of spread your wings and fly on your own uh, situation. And so there was a lot of infractions amongst the players and like I say not being on time you know things that they they could have done easily they just didn't do they just couldn't play the type of ball that Coach Christensen deserved uh, as a head coach so things turned around when Dick Nolan took over yeah Dick Dick brought in uh, a whole different uh, regime, uh, very much together, uh, everyone knowing what they had to do to be a part of a, 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 a winning effort. Uh, and that, that was from the front office right on down to the water boy. Everyone just kind of got on board for that same type of uh, we can we can do it uh, you know they they just were primed to do a 200% job all day every day and 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 Dick was in, was an easy head coach to be a, to be around he was a great guy Great you must have been doing something, right? You won seven West Division championships under him and won to two championship games. Yeah, yeah. He he just had the complete package. And and he had it with each and he had it with his coaching staff, he had it with uh each individual 
had a kind of a, a a personal relationship or as close as you could get to saying Coach Nolan, he's my buddy, you know. He'd never walk up and throw your arms around his neck or whatever, give him a bear hug, but that's the way you felt about him because uh, you knew what he was trying to do and the avenues that he was taking us. And we all knew that we were potential champions. And it's just just the way he handled it. Just the way that he handled it. How hard was it losing the Cowboys in the one championship game and losing the other one, knowing you had a chance to go to the Super Bowl? Could you say that question again? How hard was it losing in those championship games? No one like to the Cowboys and I towards the Chiefs and the other one knowing that you had a chance to play in the Super Bowl. Yeah. Wow. It 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 was to to see how far we had come and how we were playing as a team. Uh and that in itself was one of the, the 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 key equations was that we played as a team, one for all and all for one, and took the level of, of team participation to to another level, I guess you could say. It was. You made all those Pro Bowls. You played 16 years with the 49ers. How did you know when it was time to retire? Well, I I think, let me say that my last year with the 49ers was played under Coach Monty Clark, who had been a lineman for the Miami franchise. And I was a man to man DB. If you wanted to, even in the later stages of my career, when I was 36, 37 years old, I still didn't get challenged like I thought I should have gotten challenged by the opponent. But they'd work around me. They'd, they'd put passes in the air to my side. But uh, nothing in abundance to where I might could feast on them, you know, and maybe get two or three interceptions in any one game. Uh, because of the, the opposition just wouldn't put, wouldn't put in the ball up. And what I started doing... I started covering uh, decoy patterns, of which I got a lot, uh, as if they were the prime receiver. And, and that only, only just brought to the forefront uh, like I believe if you listen to if you listen to a, any kind of a function uh, like, uh, well, let's just say an event at the at the uh, Hall of Fame, this past uh, Hall of Fame class that went through, uh, my wife and I and my daughter went back, and when Chris Berman introduced me, it was similar to 10 out of 10 introductions anywhere else in the United States that was aware of, uh, of, of me being involved with, foot, with foot football. They would inevitably say that opposing opposition's 
and quarterback wouldn't throw to my area, wouldn't come to my area uh, with a pattern. And so when I started getting an ongoing game movement by quarterback staying away from my area and I'm having to create situations to try to get a ball thrown my way. It's, it's when I actually begin to uh, think about retiring. Think about retiring. What was it like when you found out you were inducted into the Hall of Fame? It was it was pretty monumental. Uh, pretty monumental. And and I and I was dealing with a lot of disbelief because I didn't really ever think it was gonna happen. Uh, I I just I just didn't think that I could garner the votes and have them at a high level to to, to become a part of that last group that was uh, a potential Hall of Famer was picked from. It, uh, but we were very excited, and I think what made it even more exciting was is the fact that local media uh, came by. You know, it was almost like uh, I had a, a, an extension of my career. There was a lot written about it. A lot of a lot of people said a lot of nice things in my behalf, uh, and so I was I was kind of beside myself, and but very very extremely uh, happy that it had finally happened. How was it for your family? Was your family excited? Yes, uh, my family was was brothers and sisters uh, were extremely ecstatic and the fan base uh, that was has been part of my uh, retirement uh, situation uh, you know the letters I got uh, you know just Congratulating me and former players uh, really just kind of brought it to the forefront that, you know, it's been a long road, but I'm very happy that uh, it's finally become a reality. When did the 49ers retire your number? Was that before the Hall of Fame or after? No, that was before the the, the Hall of Fame. And, and it was John Brody was there for it. Yes, John Brody was there to present present the the, the football to me in my behalf. Uh, yeah. Is there a game that's a favorite moment you had while playing football? Mm. Or a game that stood out? Wow. I know as Bears fans, the game that stands out is the game in the late 60s with the 49ers where Gail Sayers was it Kermit Alexander? Yeah, when Kermit, uh, I believe that was in Chicago, uh, Gil Sears. Ridley had, Field. Yes, and it was just putting up numbers that was just totally unreal. And Kermit being a a real 
tough tackler. Uh, caught Gale when Gale was making a cut. And uh, caught him up on one leg, making a real sharp cut, changing direction. And unfortunately, uh, Kermit shoulder pads and helmet hit him right at the knee and just kind of hyperextended that knee and uh, with such force that it just broke down in many, many ways, yeah. That's I talked to a lot of Hall of Famers and former players, and most of them say the greatest player they ever saw was Jim Brown. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I would, I would, I would agree with that. Because he said he was the size of defensive lineman, but he could run a fourth two. He was fast as can be, and he was almost impossible to bring down. Yes, all of those things are very, very true about Jim. And and, and like you said, he was a big, fast running back that would come at you. Uh, like a like a running like a running back that was carrying twenty or thirty pounds less than Jim Brown, but he he had the ability to to move his middle linebacker size uh, like a real uh, running quick moved uh, running back. 